Well, um, we meet here every month, the second Monday of the month, and all out there are welcome to come along. Um, admission is free. And uh, today we have got uh, Tim Where Evans. Where are we, by the way, in case people don't know? Oh, we are indeed at uh, the... Uh, Institute of Education. Yeah. Well, it's called the Institute of Education, but I think the best way to uh, sum it up is the uh, ISAS. It's not ISAS, it's the... Um, School of African Studies and Oriental Studies, and it's there. And the room is just off the uh, students' uh, bar of the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, so that, I think that's the best way. The Institute of Education, yes, that is the formal title of the place. But most people might not know that. That I mean, I used to come to this bar before I knew it was the anything to do with that. David, they would anyway, never know we were just off the bar, would they? They would have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> So, well, no, I just, uh, I just that's the part of the help to help them. Indeed, indeed. Uh, yes. We've got to keep the students going in particular, yeah. and the lecturers. But um, anyway, in any case, um, having said that, uh, I'll now introduce Tim Evans, who's kindly come to give us a talk on the uh, workings of the uh, Cobden Society. Cobden. Thank you. Cobden Centre. Cobden Centre. Marvellous. David, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be with the Libertarian Alliance, and I'm really pleased to be invited, so thank you. Um, uh, I did an interview this morning, and driving here this evening, I heard on Radio 4 Jamie White, who's one of our senior fellows, um, and uh, he was basically arguing why it was why it was immoral, or the moral hazards involved with, with the bailout of banks. So if, if today is, is a symbol of how we're doing, then we're doing okay, uh, because we're, you know, we're continuing to build our media coverage. What I wanted to do was a slightly different talk to the one I normally do about the Cobden Centre and the sort of issues it's dealing with. Normally, I will talk about Austrian economics, I will talk about um, Mises, Rothbard, the applicability of that school to this crisis. Because it's you and your sort of friends and family, I wanted to give a, a slightly different talk a, and a more personal, and dare I say it, more intimate talk. I want to briefly touch on the journey I have been on uh, since this crisis started, um, because I uh, I didn't necessarily see this crisis coming um, with any great uh, foresight or in any great advance, um, and uh, one of the conundrums I think of this crisis, as I'll explain in a moment, one of the conundrums of it is I, I'm not sure how many libertarians. Uh, and free marketers saw it coming. But, so I want to give a, a sort of a little talk about the journey I have been on and some of the thoughts I have as we move forward. And in that, I'm going to then talk about the Cobden Centre, what we do, where we're doing well, where we're probably doing badly, and how we might move forward in the future. But I'm not going to give you a sort of corporate... Cobden Centre talk. It's going to be a Tim Evans talk. So, all warts and all. So, um, I went to a meeting at a company called Marsh um, in the spring of 2007. Marsh are a big uh, insurance and reinsurance organisation. Um, they own all kinds of interesting businesses. At that time, I think they just bought Kroll, the security company, and they're headquartered next to the Tower of London. And in spring of 2007, I went for a meeting there with one of their public affairs team, and he and I walked out, and he said to me, I, I think that the economy is turning down, and I think there's quite a big recession coming. And put on the spot, uh, I found myself saying, yes, I think a downturn is coming as well, and I think it's going to be a significant recession. And I reacted to him in that way for what I'd seen happen in the previous year in the labour market. Um, odd little things had happened. I walked into an organisation in 2006 and the three receptionists in the organisation all had very, 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 very high quality master's degrees. And, and I thought, well, if ever there's a little bubble and some interesting things going on, you know, it, it's in those, and just knitting things together. Yes, I agreed with my friend on that occasion. Yes, I think there's something going on. 
Now, having said that I thought there was a recession coming, I then spent much of the summer dwelling on what I'd said and drilling into myself, really, why had I said it and why did I not just say it to agree with him and to be nice and to be courteous, but that I really felt something was afoot. And having read my Austrian economics, I indeed thought, and there were other friends around me at the time, one of them was Tom Burroughs, who some of you will know, mm. uh, uh, I thought as we moved into 2008 that indeed we were in an enormous bubble, a credit bubble, and that it was probably going to burst. I didn't know when, it could have been 2008, could have been 2009, might be later, but I felt it sufficiently worrying that I said to my wife, I think that I'm going to liquefy my private pension pot. Um, my private pension is not, you know, is, the pot is not enormous, but I have put in over the years. Um, and, uh, and I'm in a self-invested, what we call a SIP, so a self-invested private pension. And I thought it'd be prudent, I think, to sell any equities and things I've got and just hold some cash. Which is what I did. By the spring of 2008, that's what I did. And then the summer went by and I thought, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, then the latter stages of 2008 unfold. You know, September came and you saw the market dive. And you saw, for example, the, the stock market go down very quickly. Um, I think overall by about 36%. And a couple of friends of mine... Uh, took a rather short-term view and simply at the bottom of the market sold everything they got, which I thought was very sad. But there I was sitting pretty with my unbacked feared currency. And I said to Helen, you know, I said, I can see the market's going down. I can see a bubble bursting here. I think it will go down to three and a half to four thousand. And, uh, and at four thousand, I took half my cash and I went back into the market. And it did, I think, go down to about 3,600, but then it went up again. Fine. And, of course, the market went back slowly. And if you remember, we got to the end of 2008, early 2009, and the mainstream economists were saying, well, there's a recession. We've had a downturn, there's a recession. Um, but by the end of 2009, with a little bit of stimulus, um, early 2010, we'll be up and off again. And in early 2009, I started to really look at the numbers on the underlying economy. Debt, deficit, um, looked at some of the numbers relating to China, looked at some of the numbers relating to the United States, and I really poured over these numbers. And I said to Helen, I said to my wife, you might think I'm fairly potty, but... I don't see how there's going to be significant sustainable growth by 2010 or 11. I said in a darker moment, and I, for any one of you who knows me, I'm generally not a pessimist, I'm normally quite optimistic. In a dark moment, when I look at the numbers, I don't see us necessarily coming out of this, if we're not careful, for the rest of our sort of working lives. This could be, you know, I'm 46, um, so a couple of years ago I was 44. I could imagine this going on for the rest of our 40s and 50s. And Helen sat there and she listened and she registered it. And she said, yes, you might be right, that's interesting. But I could tell that it was a, is he slightly depressed? Is he slightly down? You know, one of those things that, 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 that that a partner would do, quite rightly. Uh, anyway, we went into 2009, went into the end of the year, and, of course, there was a bit of an upsurge, but nothing particularly strong. And Helen and I noticed that all the mainstream commentators, where they talked about the economy turning around, well, it was a bit like, it was a bit like the climate debate, you know, there's going to be global warming... I think in 88 they were saying it's going to be, be by 95 and we got to 93, it was going to be by 2000 and we got to 2000. 
what they named 2020, 2050. It was kind of moving away. This recovery was sort of moving away. And interesting, it was moving further away than, than we were moving through time. Um, but it was sort of in, in the spring of 2009, late 2009, that I, that I, I, I felt th that this external reality was increasingly chiming with my darker thoughts and darker prejudices. And I kept reading my Austrianism again, books I hadn't touched for 20 years. And, and I will confess that for the first time in my life, um, I, I started to have some sleepless nights. I started to think, where are we going with this? You know, Helen and I are fine, we have no mortgage, we have some property, we have some investments, we're fine. But where are we as a society, where are we as Europe, North America, where are we going with this? Now, it was in 2009 that Toby Baxendale, uh, who he and I had studied together at LSE, Toby contacted me and he mentioned that he had this organisation, the Cobden Centre, and that it had been on the back burner for some years, but he described to me his vision, which was for it to be a very robust home for Austrianism, if I put it that way, in Britain, and, and, and would I become the chief executive? And I wasn't too sure because I had several other roles at the time, and um, also I was in the middle of an MBA for my sins. I, I've just completed successfully a, a fourth degree. And at the time I said to Toby, well, you know, I'd love to do it, but I can't, because I'm in the middle of an MBA and doing other things, I've got commitments, I can't do this initially for <coughs> full time. And he and I spoke for, for a couple of months. And all the time welling up inside me was the feeling that this crisis is going to be with us for many, many, many years. That what Toby is describing is something that if I'm honest with myself, it's the most important thing that I could probably do um, at this phase in my life. And it was sort of on that basis that, that, that um, that I sort of joined the Copland Centre in the role that I have. And, and I'll come back to the Copland Centre in a minute. We went through 2010, and I think last year it was important because um, lots of people in the mainstream media, lots of mainstream commentators, lots of mainstream economists started to realise that this was not simply a recession. You know, we moved from what was a banking crisis to recession and then it was last year that what was a recession started to be a debt crisis and 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 a sovereign debt crisis and that's kind of where we're at now um, it was earlier this year that for me some important planets came into alignment because all along i felt that the many classical liberal free market commentators um, hadn't quite got to the bottom of this crisis. Um, uh, the mainstream media certainly hadn't. And it was only when Brian Micklethwaite earlier this year mentioned Detlev Schlichter to me, and only when I read his blog and was sent uh, a pre-publication copy a PDF file of his book, and I read it, that for me, I felt that I was being presented with what I would call the causal root of, uh, of, of the cancer that, is at, that, that I think is at the root of this financial crisis. And of course, that is um, uh, elastic uh, paper money, uh, fiat money, and debt lev bringing together in one of his chapters the 900-year history of fiat money going back to 11th century China and how elastic money always creates the sort of instabilities that you see today and ends up with institutional collapse or a, a, a hyperinflation. Um, that had a huge impact on me. It, I, I remember sitting there thinking, you know, we're all aware in the history of uh, science, we're all aware of blind alleys and we're all... I remember um, when Helen, my wife, was doing her PhD, her describing to me the way that the medical profession, um, I think in the mid-Victorian period, believed that tuberculosis 
was invariably caused by masturbation and alcohol. Uh, anything, oh. It, uh, <laughs> 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 calm down. Uh, calm down. <laughs> and 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 that and that you know and, and then eventually um, uh, then they accepted that uh, uh, that that, uh, that that bacteria uh, might be um, uh, a more powerful explanatory um, uh, perspective. It, f f for me, Detlev's work was was the ex expose of the bacteria at the root of the crisis. Um, and it was Brian who said that, uh, uh, in many ways, Detlev had extended some of Rothbard's writings and sort of... It goes back to a talk he gave here. Right, OK, yeah. The, the, the video at private place at his website is of a talk in this series. Isn't it? Right, OK. And that was where it started for me, because Christian Michel picked up on that, had him give the same talk. That's what I heard. Yeah. So... so, so one up to this place. Yeah, so... so uh, for me, um, uh, Detlef has been very, very important. And looking at the world from his perspective, uh, I see nothing at the moment um, to suggest that his vision of the future is wrong, sadly. Now, going back to the Cobden Centre, so there I was in 2009, uh, Toby asked me would I uh, build this organisation up, would I run it. Uh, I was reluctant to because I had other commitments. I have uh, parents who are getting older. Um, I'm an only child. I have a six-year-old daughter. I have a wife and I have other roles. But yes, I thought it was so important uh, that, that I drafted a business plan and I brought some additional money together from, from other people. And the Cobden Centre was launched or revived, because it's, it's a brand that's been around a little while, but, but there it was, launched for the purposes of, of this crisis and beyond. And the Cobden Centre is designed to be a lean and mean, fairly low cost cyber operation. Um, it is designed to be a network and hub organisation. Um, initially, when I drafted the business plan, some friends said to me, well, part of the business plan is to have a blog and the blog will be updated every day. Where will the content come from? And I believed that the content would just come. Um, whenever you create any new organisation, you're, you're in effect, you're in a chicken or an, or an egg situation. To do something, you need a little bit of money, but often the money want to see what you've done and uh, so there was this sort of early conundrum and I, I was adamant that given the nature of this crisis that, that people would want to provide us with comment that, that yes there was a Ludwig von Mises Institute and there were others uh, in other parts of the world but there wasn't an authentic British and or European voice on this crisis and that was something that we could build. So, and I, I'm pleased to say that I was proved right. Within within six months, uh, lots of people came out of the woodwork, and 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 content has not been a problem. There are new articles going up every day, and I think the recent web stats are that we've got 18 or 20 thousand visitors a month, which is not bad, uh, given that the Cobden Centre is dealing with fairly esoteric, um, you know, uh, subject matter. Um, we appointed an academic advisory panel. We got, uh, uh, we brought together a lot of the world's best Austrian scholars, people like uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto in Spain and many others, and that, and that gave us uh, legitimacy. And then we also brought together a, a network of senior fellows, people who are as concerned with this crisis as I am and many of you are, people who um, often have other jobs but who might want to do uh, interviews uh, or appear on TV or radio or might want to go and do speeches. Um, someone earlier mentioned to me that Professor Kevin Dowd and, and Gordon Kerr had gone to address um, people on the steps of St Paul's at the weekend. Yeah, they're both busy gentlemen and they've got complex lives, but flying under a Cobden brand, they were still able to do that at the weekend. Uh, Jamie White has a very important job uh, in the city, yet uh, he was on the radio 
tonight, and although he didn't hear all of it, the likelihood is it's possible, as he often does, he went on as a senior fellow from the Cobden Centre. The organisation is designed um, to provide people with a home and a platform and with titles from which they can go on and, and have an impact um, in the media, uh, on other journalists, um, and with all kinds of opinion formers and academics. Uh, tonight, before I came here, um, Nigel, I uh, got an invitation from uh, an organisation down in Bromley. Um, would I go and speak to them in the new year? Absolutely fine. Um, and uh, uh, I can't remember if it was Conservative Party or UKIP or whoever it was, but there's a group in Bromley who, who want me to go and speak uh, in January or February. So, you know, there we are. Now, the beauty of the Cobden Centre today is that, yes, we're diversifying the funding base. We've got thousands of people coming to the website every month, and we're starting to get you know, some traction with the media. And we're also getting a lot of traction on the internet. And in recent weeks, we've been able to find and appoint some really leading Austrians, some people who are very much in the, in, uh, in the, um, in the, in the Mising strain of Austrianism, uh, uh, and appointed them around Europe as senior fellows. We now have tonight a senior fellow in Finland, in Sweden, in Spain, in Italy, in Romania, France, and, and we go on round. And it's possible that in the next few weeks we might rebrand um, as Europe's leading uh, think tank or centre for, for um, honest money and social progress, uh, because in effect that's what we are. There is no other group in Europe that has bound together all these, all these people and has this amount of content and this amount of impact, although, of course, it's limited. So, um, for me, the Cobden Centre is important because I think that, as Detlev has probably said to you, though I haven't watched the video that he did with you fully, it looks to me as if the system has pretty much checkmated itself. That the causal root of this uh, is elastic money. Um, that's politicians have issued on the back of it on their deficit financing checks, which they're no longer able to cash. Um, uh, I, I think it's wholly possible. Um, I don't know. I'm not privy to any insider information, but I, I could imagine that if we get to Christmas and when the markets close, I could, you know, I could imagine theoretically, maybe the Irish um, uh, uh, or, or the Greeks, or whatever, might, when the markets are closed, decide to default. They might issue um, uh, new currencies. There was a report in the Wall Street Journal last week. Um, uh, uh, I think it's Delarouche. Uh, is talking to various central banks around Europe, and these central banks are putting in place contingency plans concerning um, the formation of new currencies, which is interesting. I personally, I agree with Detlev, I welcome defaults, um, because I think if we don't have some defaults, and, this, and we continue to kick the can further down the road, then we're going to move to a position where they monetize the debt on a scale much greater than the one they're doing even now, and that we will simply move to a hyperinflation. And to me, there's a point in healthcare where if someone gets off an aeroplane tonight with a bowler, that's where healthcare suddenly becomes rapidly militarized. There comes a moment in economic affairs where, um, where economics starts to look uh, like a war zone. And, and you know, to me, hyperinflation is the greatest nightmare of all. Uh, so to me, the Cobden Centre is to this crisis, uh, this, as Brian, I think, or other people have called, the second, the second crisis of socialism. I think the Cobden Centre to this crisis in the United Kingdom might just turn out to be uh, what um, the IEA were to... To, to the crisis of the late 70s and, and then the shifts in, in the 80s. That's me not to denigrate in any way the IEA, uh, but I do think that two years on from working with the Cobden Centre, I do think that the sort of revival you're starting to see in Austrian economics in this country um, 
and that is increasingly being acknowledged by mainstream commentators, people like Robert Peston, uh, uh, who are still not persuaded by us, but at least they know we're there and they acknowledge we're increasingly part of the conversation. I do sincerely believe that the Cobden team has had um, uh, an important role uh, in that process. Um, now to the future. Uh, to talk about uh, the Austrian School of Economics in a scholarly and esoteric manner is a great thing to do. To produce blogs uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a great thing, and to bring together uh, lots of scholars and opinion formers who might previously not have met each other. I mean, one of the one of the delights of being with the Coblin Centre, certainly over the last year, has been has been to bring together people, often, who didn't know each other, not only in Britain but in different countries. I mean, a small example of that is that two years ago, Toby Baxendale did not know Kevin Dowd, and there have been lots of sort of. Um, uh, networking to be done and to bring people together. And now I sit with an organisation, I'm constantly amazed by what this hub network is doing. I mean, I was delighted that they're coming here in the car, Jamie's on the radio. Um, they've sent me an email last week, just had this piece in the Wall Street Journal. You know, I'm really pleased that there's so much going on um, uh, that, that, that I don't feel in command of it. It's partly designed to be like that. It's designed to have lots of entrepreneurial activity. But while all that's great, there's still a huge challenge. If the Prime Minister or a minister or, or anyone in the British government or uh, in Macedonia or Slovakia or France you know, turned around and said, well, yes, what do you actually, you know, what do you think should be done? then, well, that's slightly more challenging, isn't it? Because you'll know, if you get a group of, I know, a dozen libertarians in the room or a dozen Austrian scholars, and, and then you say, what should be done? You're going to get many different opinions and, and a lot of probably disparate advice. One of the great things about the Adam Smith Institute uh, in years gone by, well, so not only were they pioneers of privatisation and deregulation in the United Kingdom, but they set up the Adam Smith Institute International. And that was an organisation that when communism fell on Eastern and Central Europe, that was one of the first organisations into Eastern and Central Europe. Um, there was a wonderful Diverse Productions Channel 4 documentary years ago. Um, uh, and it followed Madison Peary and Eamon Butler to Poland. It was while the Communist Party was still in power, I believe, and it's an amazing documentary of these 48 hours where communist ministers were welcoming the Adam Smith Institute to Poland. And a minister stands up and he says, I think something like, um, until last night I was the Ministry of Industry. Uh, this morning I've been told I'm the uh, Minister for Property Transfer or Ownership Transfer or whatever. And the Adam Smith Institute have flown in, etc. Well, to have Eamon Madsen and the ASI International team flying in and describing uh, how privatisations could be done, how they could work. That was very important at that time. And with the Cobden Centre, we have a sort of sister organisation, which is uh, called Cobden Partners, and it is very ably led by Gordon Kerr and, and Kevin Dowd. Mm -hmm. and, and really, they're in the business of... They're, they're focusing on the question of what do you do practically, not theoretically, but practically in the real world, vis-a-vis -vis banks, uh, money. Um, you know, we can talk about gold standards and competing private currencies and not having a central bank or free banking, all the different things that we would all love to talk about and have spent many years talking about. But um, uh, if there are people around who, for example, read Detlev's book, and if you're a finance minister or a prime minister, you read that and you say, yes, this is really bad. Uh, I don't want my society to implode and for there to be rights. I really want to help people. What can we do? Then I think it behoves us to have at least some people with some skill and some tools who are able to 
to give some guidance or an opinion. And that's very much what Gordon uh, and Kevin are about. So um, to sum up, this has been a real roller coaster ride for me. I did not expect to be uh, working with Toby or the Cobden Centre in the way I've been uh, in recent months. Um, uh, uh, I didn't expect, you know, kind of mid careers, I'm sure you didn't, for there to be this potentially meltdown um, economic catastrophe. Um, uh, uh, so it's a bit, it, it, it's rather out of the blue. And for me to say, yes, it's all very professional, it's all very planned, and I knew this was going to happen, that's, that's just not how it is. Um, uh, but I am mindful that the Cobden Centre has now, particularly in the last six months, got to a stage where it's got enough respect, it's got enough momentum, it's got enough traction, and it's been taken seriously enough that... that <laughs> That, that rather like the Adam Smith Institute at the end of the 80s, we are thrust into uh, levels of advice um, that, that we might have even found difficult to, to have imagined two years ago. So uh, I'm not, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that we're in contact at the moment with the British Prime Minister or anything like that, that would be absurd, but I can imagine this crisis getting to a point where um, because we are one of the few groups in Britain who I think have been generally ahead of the curve on this crisis, and increasingly the media are starting to recognise that. We know that from conversations we have. We know it from the fact that the Wall Street Journal are quite happy to put some of our fellows' material in, 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 you know, in their publication. I can imagine that, that the next year or two could be quite surprising, um, certainly for me. So that's a fairly honest um, introduction to the Cobden Centre and what's been going on and where I think it might be going. For me, uh, it's very bizarre uh, to feel that you're one of the right people in the right team, in the right place at the right time. I haven't quite had that before in this way. There's a little bit of it in Slovakia. That, this, I think, is much more profound. And the thing, I'll just conclude by saying, the thing that makes me do it more than anything else is the feeling. It's not about ideology. It's not about being a libertarian or a classical liberal. I do it because um, I am a dad now and I'm a husband and I really, really, really don't want to be in a society. Um, I don't want my daughter to be in a society uh, that goes through that Weimar 1923 sort of horror and phase. I really, and, and that's one of the big things that drives me personally. So, bared my soul a bit there. Thank you very much indeed. Any questions or contributions? Yeah, Patrick? Patrick? How long is the year this centre Okay. Um, when I ran CNE in Brussels, Every year we did an event there called the Capitalist Ball, where we brought 450 people together and we would celebrate liberty. And one evening, uh, 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 Ian Lester came along and he said that he would be interested perhaps in, in doing something with Toby and, and, it, and, and it was going to be called the Cobden Centre. Um, uh, now I was too busy to follow it up and I was really too busy to kind of not acknowledge it, but you know, I was in Brussels, that was going to be in London. I don't know what happened to that, and I've never discussed that with Toby. All I know is that Toby came to me a couple of years ago and said, would you take it for what I have? Um, uh, but I, to be honest with you, I, I kind of know what I call the modern history of the organisation. I know that it's now a registered charity. We've got gift aid this year. Uh, we've got people signing up to make donations yeah but i don't but i to be honest with you it's something that i think toby has been talking about for a number of years um uh but i don't know i can't say to you oh it, it's an idea that toby had in 2004 or 2003 or 2006 because to be honest with you i don't quite know it's, it's recent the last couple of years or so yeah i mean in terms of of, of where did you, you get your funding uh 
We get our funding from individual donors. Uh, uh, Toby, although his chairman is very graciously makes a donation, there are other uh, a couple of people who make um, gracious donations, and there are some people who give medium-sized donations, you know, 50 quid, 70 quid, 25 quid a month, and there are other people who choose to give a very small amount of money. Uh, it might be on an annual basis or each month. Um, we want to diversify the funding base because that will protect our integrity and protect our independence. We don't want to be beholden to any individual or any group. And one of the great things about working with Toby, you know, he's a very accomplished businessman, and one of the great things about him, he's one of the, the few business people who really not only loves ideas and is very sound, but he actually gets the importance of diversifying the funding base um, uh, and, and, and is constantly pushing in that direction. So, so I hope that if you were to invite me back at the end of next year, uh, yes, I could say to you we've got, I don't know, 100 or 200 or 300 donors and, and a turnover of X. Would you describe it as a kind of left or right wing organisation? Um, I'm not. I'm probably a bit of an old-fashioned libertarian on this point. I, I don't regard it or me as right wing or left wing. I'm not sure that that terminology is applicable. Um, you know, if you if you've got uh, if if you're if you're a libertarian in your free market in your approach to economics um, and for example in welfare you think that I don't know it's appropriate for a trade union to provide welfare through a friendly society does that make you right wing or left wing uh, if I'm a, a libertarian and I'm you know and I believe in property in and of the person and someone wants to engage in uh, some unusual or interesting sexual practices and I say yeah that's you know if that's what you choose that should be legal your body, your sexuality, am I being right wing or left wing? I don't know. Um, and I'm not sure it's really applicable or, or relevant. Any other questions or contributions? No, I mean, first of all, Tim, are, are you know people in the importance of Baltimore more than I do, and, and everyone here, I'm sure, knows Baltimore more about economics than I do. Mm. Um, I seem to remember one of the things where I, my first degree was in psychology. Why is it all these little snippets that are yes. in my mind, those gosh wow kind of. Things, was that there was um, some experiments done which were based on um, assessing people's how people assess the probability of something happening. Yes. And they were divided up into two groups. One were people, just ordinary people, controlled yes. people. And was the other group was people who'd been diagnosed with clinical depression. Yes. And it was found quite robustly that the people with clinical depression yes. were far more accurate in um, yes. assessing the likelihood of things happening than people without depression. In other words, people without depression had lots to experience that. Suffer from um, irrational exuberance, to use a phrase <laughs> I believe was used in financial terms a few years ago. Yes. Um, I, I keep coming back to this. Um, what on earth was going through the minds of our political and financial leaders over the last years and decades to think that in many cases they could keep spending and borrowing more money they were conceivably taking in year after year. They never ever think at some point this can't go on forever. That doesn't seem to because that's not what we read yeah. it. It's almost a psychological on what earth is going through their yeah. minds. I think that's you know, with an ex post facto rationalization, that's a brilliant question. Okay. However while many free marketeers have spent a long time um, saying, you know, government's overspending, it's all going to be reined in, um, we need more austerity, more privatisation, the welfare state's too big. I don't honestly remember, I certainly didn't, but I don't remember any other British libertarians in the main, or free marketeers, saying, the system has borrowed so much, we're so in hock, that... And, and play it through the way that debt lev does with the bond market and you know, that effectively the system has checkmated itself to a meltdown point. I will say that I spent most of the 90s and the last decade, I missed that. Yes, I've argued that the government's overspending it shall be reined in, but I didn't quite grasp um, the debt lev point about the system having checkmated itself. 
So if I didn't get it, and most of the free marketeers I know didn't get it, I'm inclined to forgive uh, or to at least accept that, well, the politicians didn't get it either. Now, yes, it all looks very plausible and understandable, doesn't it? I know that looks deeply, I can see that's it's, very unsatisfactory. It's, 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 like, it's like someone maxing out a credit card, then getting another credit card the next day, maxing that out, and then another one, then another one. So at some point, some nagging thing that this cannot go Yeah, I, okay, I suppose. Maybe, maybe yeah. because we're always told somehow, somehow uh, I'm, I'm looking at the Warner Castle, the yeah. Grantham Thatcherite yeah. housewife, you know, that somehow they yeah. the different, they can always act more, they can always yeah. see that. But remember, Nigel, when we were kids, remember how Japan was going to be the future, mm. and that it suddenly wasn't. I think a lot of people in North America and Europe believed that even if they were maxing out the credit card a bit, you know, there was there was huge growth in Southeast Asia, there was going to be huge growth in China, you know, Latin America, there's going to be lots of scope for global growth, OK? The, oh, to be honest, again, this, I decided to give a personal talk, so it's about a personal journey. The only person who sort of got rather worried about China and their holding of US bonds was um, was Antoine Clark. When about 10 years ago, if you remember, he tried that publication, Tan Staffel Times. Well, one of the editions was about the, bizarrely, about the meltdown scenario that we might face uh, um, you know, if we got to the point where the market started to believe that the T-bonds uh, weren't written the paper, uh, weren't worth the, the paper they're written on. And, uh, but in the main, uh, and even now, I'm not sure that, that most commentators fully understand the extent to which there's a property bubble in China, uh, that their banks in, their bank system, their central bank is massively over leveraged. Um, and of course, given the nature of the politics, they can't stop constructing these empty cities because when they do, there'll be unemployment, social upheaval, and all the rest of it. So I think, you know, China could end up looking rather like Japan, not too much growth there. And now, with the euro, maybe there'll be some defaults. That'd be great if there was. But if there isn't, and, and the Europeans go on, and they do monetize the debt, um, uh, you know then the inflationary consequences of that could be grave. One, you know, at the moment, we're in this wonderful debate, aren't we, between the pound and the euro. Well, if the euro drifts down in the months and years ahead, and the pound starts to ride high, as the French, as the Swiss franc did, um, so that you have the rise of the far right in Switzerland, the authoritarian far right in Switzerland, and you have um, the exporters becoming, putting ever more pressure on the Swiss government and the Swiss central bank, as they did, so the point that then Switzerland decides to peg its, uh, to, to, to peg the, the franc to the euro. Um, uh, I mean, I could imagine, you know, the pound riding high here to such a point that growth is stifled even more, or the recession is worse. Um, and I can imagine, I can imagine sentiment uh, turning against our bond market. Well, if sentiment's turning against the euro you know, the continental bond market, and then it turned against us. What are the consequences when, when people then go on to ask the questions, hang on, are the Americans actually going to have the growth um, to, to, you know, to make their bond market, their team, viable in the medium and long term? And uh, I think those set of questions are extremely worrying. Um, you know me, you know I'm not, normally not a pessimist, but... Uh, the extent to which the system has checkmated itself, I think it's very, very worrying. But, but were any of us in this room five or ten years ago talking to each other about the system checkmating itself? Maybe you were, Bob. Maybe you were. And, that's great. and if you were, that's fantastic. Go for it. Well, I remember Paul Marx sitting on my sofa in about 2003 using language like Ponzi scheme. Yeah. He's a man of depressive award. He's just a depressive man. Yeah. He's just congenitally miserable. So he's well disposed to see these things. But I, so that would be one answer to what Tim was saying. Mm. I think also lots of Americans did. There are quite a few yes. financial disaster books written yeah. in America, encouraging the, most of them from an Austrian general, generally. Austrian sort of gold bug, gold bug perspective. Yeah. Which is, thank goodness, because that means that, that the least worst 
theoretical attitude to all this is the Austrian school, and I do believe that. And I think the parallel with Marxism before the Great Crash is remarkably exact in the sense that the Marxists were few in number, but immensely confident that they knew what was happening. Now, I think they were talking absolutely out of their asses. They had not a, they, their theoretical explanation of the Great Depression was complete bollocks. They didn't believe that. They were so confident, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, when you compare them to Marxists now, I mean, Marxists now just don't have a clue. They're just running around like headless chickens saying it's terrible, we hate capitalism, but they're not proposing any alternative. But in those days, they were. They were very confident that capitalism was wasteful, stupid, ridiculous, and should be replaced by clever people like themselves running the world from, from an office. Yeah. They really felt it, and they, they yeah. meant it. They didn't yeah. just say yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I think... I think there are enough Austrian, and, and no one just locally, Bruce Nichol, you mentioned how he... Yes, that's true, come. that's true. I mean, in England... And, and the certainly Austrian, the von Mises crowd, London, the hardcore of it. Few, yes, there are Absolutely. a few kind of Absolutely. rather incoherent eccentrics like Paul and, and Bruce. I mean, Bruce is not exactly a writer of books, is he? He's more like a, a sort of, I don't know, he's a professional photographer, isn't he? So, yeah. So, I mean... They were eccentric people, but the ones influenced, as you say, by the Americans, yeah. who read the Mises stuff a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the Americans, the American Austrian school movement, can claim we saw this coming. I agree we with said that. It was coming. I agree with that. I don't think we libertarians in London can the same, yes. say the same thing, uh, because the ones of us who did, we, we didn't make enough of it. Yeah. Gouge publications. And yeah. The other thing I just want to say in answer to Nigel's question. It's very simple. It's short-term, long-term. If you're a politician and you've got a nightmare week coming ahead, election and and you you've got a choice between a, a nightmare right, you know, next week that you are going to be asked about in the House of Commons, compare that to, to a, an even bigger catastrophe of three years down the line. No contest. No yeah. contest yeah. at all. Yeah. You don't have to talk about, uh, you know, what 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 possessed them. <laughs> what possessed them is. Is their own self-interest. Yeah. It, it, it's not mysterious to me that uh, decision makers and banks, by the way, just the same principle. Mm. You know, look at um, who's that chap, who, Matt Ridley, who uh, yeah. you know ought to have known better. He was begging for government help with the best of them when uh, Northern Rock was was wobbling. Uh, wasn't such a rock. So I mean, it's it's not mysterious at all. Yeah, yeah. It, you don't need complicated psychological theories. And by the way, central to Detlef's view of things is that it's, it's a pretty important point that, that he's, he's pessimistic about inflation, not because he thinks politicians aren't aware of the dangers of inflation, but because he just thinks they're aware of the dangers of other things even more, yeah. like having burning missiles thrown through their office windows. You know, that, that's yeah. what they're really frightened of. Yeah. And it's, it's, not, it's not surprising. Yeah. Sorry, no, that's fine. I um yeah, it's good. <laughs> there's nothing so um people do stupid things but to be intelligent and do stupid things you have to have a theory yes and they had a theory that there was a new paradigm there was a China effect there was um borrowing leads to growth which validates the borrowing yes Keynesian multiply kind of view of life. Um, but it is fairly astonishing that um, the spending went up in quite such a way. After all, if they're really be, going to be truly Keynesian about this, they, um, in the good times you save. Ah! Yes. Ah, mm. big box of money. Yeah. Um, which they didn't do, of course. Mm. But they had the theory that, you know, this was, these were, we were going to all join in the proceeds of growth. It was the, the China Revenue Paradigm. These things would go on. And yet, every dinner party, apparently, in Hampstead, we're I mean, not chatting about this and that. We'll say, "What's your house worth?" It's amazing, yep. you know. I didn't it can't go on. I hope it does. Um, and I'm going to work on the work on the principle that it will. Of course, it didn't. So, um, having read my Austrian stuff, I did say, "Me, me, me." I did know that it, it had to go running to a fall. What I didn't realise, because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't studied that part of it, though we all now had in the last three years, is that the banks had bet 35 to one that it wouldn't happen. Right. I didn't know that. What? 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 what I didn't know that. <laughs> what the hell are we doing that? Um, so what we had is is not uh, it's 
a financial crisis directly. It was an investment crisis mm. for good old Austrian reasons. Mm. Mm. There was a surge of investment in a certain area that meant that once it was everyone was up and doing it, it couldn't it couldn't possibly pay. Yeah. It's going to be over investment. It's going to be bad yeah. investment. Now I didn't know it was going to be a banking crisis in its in its wake. Yeah. Uh, now a banking crisis is if you have one, you should have one. In which, in that, in which case the, the shareholders should get wiped out. The management should get the company go under. Other banks should take over. Hmm. Things should carry on. I didn't realise that in the present stage we now have the system whereby they have to put on life support. That nothing's allowed to go bust. Hmm. So as you say, there, there are not the defaults. Absolutely. No, I don't want the defaults. Hmm. I don't want money that disappears into thin air from into the thin air from whence it came. But the, 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 that is the present system. A system yep. with a using a commodity money, such as gold, would mean that there would be borrowing, there would be lending. There will, but, that, but that's because there will be saving. Absolutely. And not merely credit creation, which is thought to be a good thing because it powers, it powers them, it powers them. In other words, you can just print assets to invest, which was, you can't, you mm. just can't do it. There is an element of um, forced saving. You can, you can run down the... Uh, run down the purchasing power of the savings of old people, mm. like others, mm. which I'm approaching that condition. Um, and that can, for a while, in certain circumstances, help nicely. So, so something could be done with the money that would have been spent later by the people concerned, but they've gone far beyond that. Mm. Absolutely. So, so I did see the, uh, not alone, of course, I did see that there was going to be a downturn, not, so, not such a crisis, but it's only a financial crisis because it was originally an investment crisis. It was an investment crisis because it was a crisis of state money. Mm. What is the question here? The question here is, why is it viewed as an economic crisis? It can only be an economic crisis if the politicians make it so. Mm. After all, standing, sitting back and looking at it, the, the world has never been so productive. There's never been so much capital, never so much human capital, never so, much, never so many people, never so many educated people, even in this country. There's no reason why our output can't be very high. And of course it is, in some certain respects, the highest it's ever been in human history. This is something to, to welcome, to be. How good this all is. Why should we, so, why we should be so gloomy? Well, the, the gloominess comes from the fact that there's no economy that can't be screwed up by politics. Mm. And it would, well, it has been, and it will, I fear it will be screwed up. Mm. Not I think, the, well, not I think, sorry, I was going to say, yeah. I think what you've also done something to explain why a lot of people didn't see this coming. Because... The question was, how come life is so good? And the answer was what you just said. Lots of people doing lots of stuff and being educated and working hard and doing clever stuff. Mm. I mean, technology, you know, and all that. I think that was part of oh, the Oh, the, 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 the consumption hasn't, wasn't faked. Mm. The output Absolutely. wasn't faked. Mm. So, yep. so, so that was right. But it wasn't as good as government spending assumed it might be in the future. Yeah. In other yeah. words, they were getting yeah. so massively. Yeah. Overborrowed, the, yeah. the, the, the creature growth couldn't couldn't cope. And if it then hit an Austrian cycle, <coughs> they would get their spending coinciding with the rapidly diminishing tax stake. Yes, and then they're well, they're then where we are. Yeah, yeah. What they're then doing in response to this, uh, I, I do like you. I have my dark moments. I haven't yet yeah. bought a shop down and got a cellar full of um, dried goods, as they do in America. Because I think if you do that, they'll come around and raid your house and take away the shotgun, the gold, and the dry goods and distribute them fairly to state officials, mostly. Um, so it's, it's probably pointless to do this, although in the short run it might be sensible enough to do such things, though I haven't done it myself. Hmm. But I have some gold and some silver. But um, what's the question? Um, should we be more optimistic? In a sense, should we? Is it the Compton Center's job, amongst others, to say, calm down, calm down? The world's a wonderful place. Yeah. We're very productive. We just have to frank up, face up, to the fact that certain people think they're very wealthy because they have IOUs or monetary instruments or something that makes that means they're, they're rich. But they're not rich. Hmm. Right? You're not going to get that money. Yeah. It's gone. If you take the question, is it our job to be optimistic? I think, first of all, and I see it in stages, I think that just as the IEA spent many, many years, from the late 50s through the 60s and the 70s, being thought of as losers, mm -hmm. as somewhat irrelevant, you know, 
eccentrics that talk about you know getting rid of the rent acts and you know rent controls and, control. yeah, and why should the railways be owned by the state it's all very odd you know that I think that the Cobden Centre's role certainly in the United Kingdom uh, is to be known by enough people you know mainstream commentators, mainstream media, the Robert Pestons, or for them to know that we're part of the conversation, for them to feel it, for them initially to think, ah, oh, yes, well, they're not the mainstream and they're probably overly pessimistic. And, um, and, uh, and for us to be, you know, for most people to feel that in the short term we're losing, we're, we're, we're losing the debate, perhaps. And in a way, I'll repeat again, it's something I'm sure Debt Level has said to you. I hope this time you're wrong with your pessimism. I hope I'm wrong. And I know that Debt Lev really, really wants to be wrong because, you know, he's a family man as well and he's got a life and, you know, all, you know, um, <laughs> this is one you want to be wrong on. Uh, but if we're not wrong, then I hope that our pessimism is heard. But I think we've also got to go beyond the pessimism, as indeed the IEA, and particularly the Adam Smith Institute, always did, not just to describe why things were bad and why there was a crisis, but to also uh, do some thinking on how they might be made good. And there are several things I think we've now built and got in our armory on, on what I would call the good news front, okay? The first is Copland Partners. I mean, we have a proper functioning organization that has serious ideas and serious people um, you know, on how to reform banking systems, accountancy systems, um, thinking about new monetary orders, all that stuff. Um, one of the directors of the Cobden Centre, Steve Baker, is uh, a member of parliament. And as some of you will know, he's done a great job in the last 18 months of he and, and friends of his bringing private members' bills to the House of Commons, talking about reforming banking. And, and um, I don't know this, but it might be at some point they might be able to bring you know, something to Parliament to reform legal tender laws. You know. Now, while all that stuff might not be taken seriously in the short term, uh, well, as this crisis goes on, it's the sort of kite flying uh, that might just be taken up by whoever in the House of Commons. It might be something that's Remember Ho 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 by Ed Balls in a year, or by someone who in next July becomes the Chief Secretary at the Treasury. Uh, you know, we don't know, but, but, uh, but, but Steve and people like Douglas Carswell and others in the House of Commons uh, have flown some really interesting kites. The kites would have been very difficult to imagine being flown in the House of Commons. Let me put it that way, four or five years ago. Um, uh, I think it makes, you know, when you have people like Alistair Heath doing editorials every week in the uh, in City AM, read by 100,000 people in the city, saying that uh, fiat currencies will be tested to the maximum in 2012, 2013, which is what he said the other day. When you have uh, people like Gordon and... and, and uh, and Professor Dowd, Kevin, um, no doubt talking to all kinds of people overseas and, 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 uh, and having an organisation able to reform systems, who knows where that will go. But for me, that's the optimistic bit. That's, you know, if, if the crisis is coming and if there are, if, 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 um, if uh, the worst of it's going to be avoided, that I'm prepared to bet my money that it's going to be something relating to the Cobden family, certainly in the United Kingdom, or maybe even Europe, that, that will help it. I bet, we'll, I bet we'll have a bit of a fingerprint on it, probably. Fairly limited in my optimism, but it's not yeah, just yeah. pessimism. Keeps you going. Keeps you going, Bob. If you'll allow me, yeah, so I've I got another answer to Bob about the optimist thing. Um, and I recently attended a, uh, the Christmas party of the Adam Smith Institute, and before that, 
the talk to the Adam Smith Institute given by Detlef Schlichter. It was his routine performance, so I actually literally went to sleep during his talk, partly because I was in a very bad mood, because I had forgotten to bring my camera and because it was too hot and all that. But I basically had heard it before. But what was impressive to me about those events uh, was the people there. Um, all my kind of libertarian life, I've been attending events like this one where either, as this evening, a small number of scrappy middle-aged men, or, you know, when we really turn out its strength, a quite large number of scrappy <laughs> middle-aged men, with a few additions, Eastern European women, strange, you know, old elderly gentlemen in very smart suits with double barrel names. But basically, the guts of it is badly dressed, bonds with paunches, hair that's seen better days, <coughs> gathering and agreeing about how right we all are about everything. Well, this Adam Smith crowd is now, first of all, it's, it's got lots of hair. It's almost all of it dark. So in other words, there's a big Asian kind of mixed race thing going on there. I, I don't know where that comes from, but it's true. Um, they're all wearing dark suits, very dark suits. Sociologically, it's a different crowd of people. And I asked him about this, and, and I think he identified for me the connection, which is that Detlef Schlichter, we've heard the names already, did an interview for City AM, uh, which had at the bottom that there was going to be a talk by Schlichter to the Adam Smith Institute, and all these young guns, the city, the more thoughtful younger city people, who are inclined to want to think that their elders are better than fucked up in a big, in a big scare, you know, sort of think they're like 25 to 30, mm -hmm. sort of inclined to believe, more so than people aged 50, who've actually done the fucking up. Um, they, a, a tiny proportion of that 100,000, which is actually a lot of people compared to the number of people in this room, it turned up for that Schlichter tour, and then in even greater numbers for the Christmas party. And I've never seen so many young men who I had no idea who they were, you know, who are these characters? Mm. So, and what Tim said to me when I asked him about this, and how did this happen, and he told me about the Schlichter notice in City AM, which had gotten there, um, was that this that Austrianism is sort of becoming the orthodoxy, insofar as there is such a thing, intellectual orthodoxy, in the city. I mean, most yeah. people in the city don't yeah. have an intellectual orthodoxy, they just have a job to do today, and uh, a, a couple but, of... But for those who are thinking, it's, it, it is emerging from academia and from political activists like ourselves. Yeah, a, a couple of friends from the City AM team uh, uh, came to see me four or five weeks ago, and and they also went to see a couple of other friends at the Adam Smith Institute. And I was asked, and the Adam Smith Institute was asked, um, who should City AM be promoting in the context of this crisis? You know, have we got any additional names? And I said, well, very much from a Cobden point of view, you know, the, the, if, if I was going to choose two names, it'd be Kevin Dowd, and it'd be Detlef Schlichter. And uh, that was duly noted, and I think it was reported back. And I, then I noticed sort of a week later or two weeks later, yeah. Detlef had his article, and it went from there. Um, there are, you know, I mean, if you, come to the, if you go to the Cobden website, as I think some of you probably do, we have built the most phenomenal stable of 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 commentators. I mean, Sean Corrigan is a huge, uh, you know, player in the city, and he does stunning work. We have uh, people like uh, Philip Bagus and David Howden, great LVMI scholars, but who are now in Europe and, and write for us from time to time. And there are many, you know, there are, there are dozens of writers that we have. Um, uh, so it is not just Detlev and Kevin and Gordon or me or Toby. Where it's, it's you know, there's a, there's a whole there's network now. And, and what's amazing, you know, they're all connected quite well academically, or many of them are connected in various financial institutions, etc. And but but it's only in the last three or four months, as the crisis has gone on, that I've started to feel that that um, that our ideas are starting to get. And City AM is certainly an important part of this. Mm -hmm. Very important part of the story. But it's starting to get some serious traction, and I feel it's becoming, yeah, a, 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 an orthodoxy in the city. Let me put it this way: if I was a Keynesian activist in the city in some way, um, I can't imagine that at the end of 2011 I wouldn't be aware 
of 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 the Austrians and City AM and 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 our guys, mm. and I would start to feel now quite pessimistic. I think that these guys are getting they're getting that really powerful ticket to the future, mm. the atmospherics of inevitability. I, the, you know, I've been following the CNBC yeah. business for the last three years. Yeah, since, since the thing broke in uh, August two thousand eight. Yeah, and uh, they have regular. Plainly Austrian Absolutely. Chaps on. They're, they're fairly impressive. So it's. Absolutely. It's, it's encouraging and galling that lots of these young libertarians have never heard of us. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny, you know, I, I gave well, We may have got there indirectly through. Yeah, there was. We did, but, um, yeah, there was a big, uh, there was a big gathering of some students um, at Oxford University on Friday. And uh, although I haven't caught up with him, Toby spoke at lunchtime and then I spoke in the late afternoon. I didn't see him, so I, we haven't compared notes. But. There must have been about 100 in the room when I spoke. Mm -hmm. And some of them were sixth form students uh, hoping to go to Watsford later. And, they, you know, they came from all kinds. Some of them were in their early 20s and already graduated. But, um, you know, some of them were economists, some of them were philosophers, social scientists, disparate group. Uh, I was really delighted. I hear a bottle smashing. I was really delighted by the number of people who were really, really, already in the know about Austrian economics in a way that, and I spoke to this group a year ago, you know, the previous group were not that interested and hadn't heard of it. They, a lot of these guys had heard of it, and those that hadn't were, when I had it sort of explained to them, they were quite inspired by it in, in a way that, 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 that I think only Keynesians would have been inspired with their audiences, their students, you know. This is what 50 I, years ago. I really felt that. Marxism in, say, 1930. Absolutely. That sense of, of, we don't know whether we're going to be able to cure the world's ills. We sure as hell know what those ills are. And if we had the chance, we could probably sort it out. Absolutely. It's pretty scary, but we could do it. Absolutely. No, and we're confident nobody else has a clue. Yeah. Which is, that's what the Marxists were like. They really, really were. Yeah. yeah. We're right. So, I mean, people, think most people... I mean, none of us were alive when the Marxists were as confident as the Austrians are right now. Mm. So, I, I have That's to, to, to rush to thank you. Lovely to see you, Bob. Can I get in contact with you? Yes, of course. I, I should yes, volunteer course. for some of this. Yes, no, indeed. No, please do, please do. I have to go to the before it gets blown down. Okay? Right, mm -hmm. right. Thanks, Bob. I mean, please sign up, Bob, and yeah, do, yeah. make a donation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, any more questions? Uh, yeah, I'm just mentioning about. I looked at the website. Yes. And, and, and it said about uh, honesty, economics, and uh, management matters, financial matters. And yes. And it's, it's, I looked at you, your sort of mission statements, and that, you know, they're quite sweeping. And I thought it's very difficult to get people involved in what they mean, what you mean by honesty in, in these in financial markets. I know, because I mean, I've been banging on for years and years and years about uh, uh, people at the top earning eight million a year, or the, you know the, the head of the, the head of the HR department on nearly four million a year, and well, people at the bottom might be on a minimum wage, and no matter how much you bang on about this, at a certain level, people don't see this as a problem. I mean, it is. Absolutely, it's outrageous. But to say people generally, they, they they don't see it as a question of honesty. Just to give you an example of that, that disparity, yeah. they, they don't see that as a, a, an issue of honesty or an issue of anything. Yes. Um, why I don't know. I mean, they're more interested that three folks next to them is earning, you know, is earning a few more pennies for doing the same job. Yeah. Their Yeah. But it's it's not just the eight million. It's the it's the overwhelming sense that the bastard hasn't been earning it. Yeah. He's oh, been causing eight million oh, quid worth of crime. I mean, let me answer your point. Let me answer your. Particular case. I mean, that guy lost the taxpayer. Yeah. Uh, recently, thirteen billion. Yeah. It was a markdown on RBS taxpayer shares. Yeah. Thirteen billion. Yeah. Um, and, and then he, he then he just took time off from the stress. Yeah. Um, you know, but, but, I mean, the, these are, but these are the only ones we know about. 
this because it's a board level. I mean, just below board levels, yeah. the ones we don't know. Yeah. And then even more, I can yeah. see, it would be even more outrageous. Because, yeah. And you'd never hear about it. Sure. Thank but, but, I mean, even a lot of the things in the public domain, um, run of the mill stuff, which you might point out to people, I mean, which are pretty outrageous. I mean, <coughs> I, I, I could say, we're going to have time here. Mm. People, although it is dishonest and unfair mm. and all the rest of it, people don't seem to, to um, mm. be that concerned about it. Mm. Perhaps they are now, relatedly. Um, well, thank you, thank you for looking at thank you for looking at the website. Yeah. Um, uh, you're right to notice the phrase "honest money." Um, if we were here in 1978, and I said to you that in the future the Soviet Union will collapse, Richard Branson will be launching a private space company, Sainsbury's will have a bank, um, and uh, and uh, the government will have sold off two million council houses, you might have thought I'm fairly wacky, but. Uh, uh, I remember the night when the word radical shifted its meaning somewhat in British politics. Uh, it happened in late 1987 when a BBC journalist talked about Thatcher and her radical economics. Before that, the word radical had invariably belonged to the centre-left, um, but, but it shifted. Uh, the, the Cobden Centre, we're really interested in capturing that phrase over time, honest money. And getting people to understand that monopoly fiat currency is dishonest money. You know, the pound has been debased, what is it, to 98.8% since 1950, um, or debauched since 1950 at that level. Um, it is a phrase that today or in the last two or three years might not have resonated with people. But I'm confident uh, that as this crisis moves forward and we gain more media traction and, and more traction with opinion formers more broadly, that it's a phrase that we can give meaning and substance to and that people can think of the system that we've got today particularly the monetary system, as being somewhat dishonest. There have been in the last hundred years or so, effectively four different monetary orders. I think it was Alastair Heath who said last week in one of his editorials, he thought that at the end of this crisis there would be a new monetary order. I agree with him. Uh, and I think that to talk now in terms of honest money, but to be fairly clear what you mean by that, um, is a wise strategic and tactical move. So it might appear to be a bit woolly at the moment, but I think it will get substance and form over time. But you are friends and family, so if you disagree with that, I'd be really interested to well, hear why. Again, right. yes, yes. Um, one of the things I'm most interested in about the Cobden Centre, and Steve Baker in particular, hmm. is their absolute refusal to indulge in cheap abuse of the left. Yes. The argument being that with respect, and it's genuine in the mm. case of Steve Baker, with me it's a bit of an effort, but I, you know, I take the point. The left may be wrong about what to do, but they're right, and they have been right for longer than the, the right, mm. that there is a problem. They were flagging up this banker's profligacy mm. for longer than most free marketeers in Britain have been doing uh, and they should get the credit for that mm. they, they, they were correct about that. Yeah. And, so you and, and the best explanation for it by the way I heard Jamie White this afternoon and yes. I recorded it and I'm going to transcribe his stuff into the, very good. Into the blog I write for and he, he, he explained it very well that, that what the government has done is, is to put bankers in a situation where any risk they take is underwritten by the government. Absolutely. And, and in effect, they've been pouring money into the into the hands of, of financial <coughs> services salespeople. Yeah. And uh, he, he, what White was talking about was how do you regulate banks given that this is what's going on. His answer was stop 
underwriting the risks they're taking. Yes. You can't possibly keep the lid on a kettle that you are simultaneously boiling. That's right. He didn't use that language, but that, that's what he was getting at. Yeah. You, can't, you can't regulate something that you have deranged so completely with your guarantees of non-loss. And, and these guys, the, the gentleman over there was quite rightly complaining Absolutely. about are people who cannot lose. Yeah. One of the, uh, I mean, S Steve uh, is uh, uh, a great Cobdenite, and he is, uh, I think, one of the interesting things about Steve, he's only been in the House of Commons 18 months, but he's carved out a really interesting niche. He's extremely respectful. He's extremely polite, well-mannered, and he's extremely scholarly. I mean, he's very, very well-read in his Mises and his Rothbard and in, in all the important literature. And when he addresses the House of Commons, uh, he's always listened to very, very intently and very, very respectfully. I mean, without naming names, there are Labour MPs who have heard him and have travelled across the chamber onto the Tory benches to say that was really, really interesting. And I'm sure Steve's had some strange looks from colleagues in his own benches because of that. But he really is one of those unusual characters able to resonate with, with thinkers wherever they come from. And uh, although I wasn't there, uh, I, I heard... Uh, Steve chairs the all-party parliamentary group on banking, economics and money, or economics, banking and money. And uh, I think there was a, an event recently with um, Ben Dyson, who's a great guy from Positive Money, uh, which is a um, great organisation. And... Uh, and I think Mike, Michael Meacher was there. And uh, whether it's Michael Meacher or the people like Frank Dobson, there are all kinds of people on the Labour benches who really come to respect Steve uh, and, and, and Sir Douglas Carswell and others. I'll say politically, I, I think what's interesting about that is uh, I can imagine, I can imagine a time now, it might be 2012, it might be a bit later, but I can imagine... Um, some of these Labour MPs getting to a character like Ed Balls and um, and Ed Balls or people on the Labour front bench asking questions of the Conservative almost from what you might call a left libertarian perspective that are very 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 difficult for the Prime Minister to answer partly because he might not have thought about this at all. I mean if Ed Balls was to get up and to say to what extent do you think this crisis you know has at its bedrock uh, a systemic failure of the model of banking. You know, the governor of the Bank of England has already said we've got the worst banking order you could possibly have. And by the way, do you think we're in a fiat money crisis? What would the prime minister say? You know, has he been briefed on that? Uh, uh, what I'm saying is that Steve is one of those characters. He's a bit like um, he's a bit like a match holder on a firework night. You can imagine him being respected across the benches and him just lighting a little blue touch paper you know, somewhere in the House of Commons that goes off, impacts on someone else, like an Ed Balls, and suddenly it, it's thrust into mainstream main, mainstream debate. Um, I never, I, he doesn't concede anything on the intellectual front. No, he doesn't. So interesting. He, he never insults people. No. Um, I know, because I, I, I sat next to him and insulted him to see what he would do. He's very polite, very sweet man. Mm. Um, mm. If he can put up with that sort of food, then he can put up with mm. much more impressive and important ones. Of course, if that were to... Um, if, if... But at the same time, so this combination of extreme decency at the personal level with absolutely no pretense that he's a, an orthodox left-winger or anything like that. And, and uh, there's, therefore, people like Michael Meachie, you, you don't get the feeling, oh, this fellow's having it on, you know, he's, he's trying to manoeuvre us into saying yeah. things we don't believe or supporting things we don't like. He, he just frankly comes out and says, I was at the meeting, by the way, that okay. you were talking about. Yeah. Um, he just says, you know, that there's common ground. I, I would summarise it as, as saying that Baker is interested in talking to anyone who, who is asking the question, what is wrong with the financial system? He's, he's not insistent upon them agreeing with him about the answer. Yes, but he, he he wants to he wants to have a conversation with anyone who's interested in the question. Yeah, yeah. Can I conclude? Because I know we're going to run to close. Can I just conclude by saying that in my first um, in 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 these months and this period with the Cobden Centre, um, 
often, uh, particularly with the Cobden theme, often I've shied away slightly from getting involved in the nitty gritty of debate. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that the Cobden team is broad enough and diverse enough to have to have heated debates within its within its own ranks. And I think that's really good. Um, I see, I've seen my role as chief executive partly as a diplomat. Um, sometimes the debates do get quite heated um, uh, when you have clever, intelligent people involved with forceful opinions. That happens, and there, there have been times. But I, I've, I've tended in the first couple of years to, to try and write above that and just to build the team. And where I'm at now, I'm just really pleased that one of the contributions I've been able to make is to you know, introduce people like, like Steve Baker to old friends like Kevin Dowd, because maybe they would might not have met each other otherwise, who knows, it could have gone on another few years before they met. And that and that um and that all these people are doing such extraordinary things. Uh, I want to conclude by saying something might sound slightly irrational, but I just feel that what the Cobden Centre is doing is extraordinarily important. Maybe, I don't know, Arthur Seldon or Lord Harris did all that work in the late 50s and the 60s and the early 70s because they too felt that their day was going to come or you know, that, that their work was, their truths were going to be recognised as eventually they were. I kind of feel that with the Cobden Centre. However, I think it's going to happen, happen much quicker. I don't think I'm going to be involved with it for 20 years and then eventually, lo, you know, um, Steve Baker gets a, a bill through Parliament or, 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 or the world changes. Part of, the, part of the fear is that it's actually all going to happen quite quickly. And part of the question is, are we ready in time and are, are we there? Well, today, at the end of 2011, I can answer that by saying... I'm reasonably confident that we've got a good organisation with a great team that can go on now. It's got a sufficient foundation to it, legally, financially, um, in terms of the team, in terms of the, the contacts and the outreach, to really have some significant success. So I end this year uh, at one level more fearful and more depressed about the future, but at the other, at a practical level, reasonably optimistic that, that Cobden Centre might truly be able to make a significant uh, change for the better. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.